well, we're, we're great. All right. Oh, well, glory. Welcome again. Let me just back up a little bit and, uh, and, and bring us back up to speed what we've been talking about uh, the last uh, couple of, of uh, well, sp- specifically last Wednesday, we were talking about what the Holy Spirit does uh, when we're saved. And Sunday, uh, Sunday was a great Sunday. Uh, we had two um, get, give their heart to the Lord on Sunday. We baptized two on Sunday. It was fantastic. I'll tell you, I absolutely love it. And I can tell you what the Holy Spirit did in those situations. Amen? I mean, those names were written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, new life was given to them. They have a hope because of what the Holy Spirit was doing in them. They have a hope in heaven. And so we're just, we rejoice with them. But I want to go back and remind you of, of the interview, the, the conversation that, that Jesus was having with Nicodemus. Amen? With Nicodemus. And, and uh, we remember that... Uh, he was he was asking about being born again and and the new birth and and uh, all those kinds of things and and the interview is the first of a series of individual encounters between Jesus and persons who fit the description given at the end of chapter two those who approach Jesus with an inadequate. Uh, level of faith. And Jesus' words are unmistakable and to the point, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And how true is that? And how we rejoiced on Sunday that two more that fit in that category were transferred out of that into our, our I mean, it's not transferred into a category. It's They become part of the family. They've been grafted in. They've been adopted into the family of God. And, and I, I rejoice. But we have to remember, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of, of, of God. You, you just can't. And as harsh as that may sound, it's not my decree. It's the Bible. And, uh, and so we have, to, we have to share that. So it was a revolutionary concept that uh, Jesus revealed to this uh, Pharisee, rather devout Pharisee actually, that the kingdom would come to the whole world, not just to the Jews. Amen? Remember that Jesus said, he made the declaration that there's now no longer Jew nor Gentile. Right? There's no more, there's no more division. We're, we're, if you have Christ in your life... You are a part of the family of God regardless of your heritage. Amen. You've got a new heritage. <laughs> Amen. We have a new heritage. And so it was revolutionary uh, to them, uh, to, to Nicodemus and to those like him, that the kingdom of God is personal. That's one of the things I remember that I pointed out specifically on Sunday as I was giving the altar call, that it is a personal invitation. That Jesus Christ is, he's not just throwing some broad thing out there that, you know, it's personal. It's it's a personal invitation. He died on the cross personally for you and I. He resurrected from the dead personally for each one of us. When you begin to understand that, when you begin to look at salvation in those kinds of terms, it gives salvation, if, it, if I can even say this, it, I might get, I don't but it, it kind of gives more weight to the whole idea when I realize that Jesus died for me. For me. It, it, it was personal. It wasn't an, it's not a national thing. It's not an ethnic thing. It, 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 it's entrance requirements are repentance and spiritual rebirth. You must be born again. There's no question. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You must be born again. So Jesus later taught that God's kingdom has already begun in the hearts of the believers. You and I are already living eternally. Right? Here's the sad part about that. Those that are outside of the kingdom of God are also living eternally. And unless they make 
a change, it's going to be an eternal torment, eternal separation from God, and that ought to break our heart as God's people. Um, so only God and the Holy Spirit gives new life from heaven. So it's God's Spirit. It's not our effort. The inter- as looking, I, I, I keep referring back to Sunday because I'll tell you what, there's nothing that gets me more fired up than having somebody get saved. I'll absolutely love it. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, 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 it was no effort on their part. Amen? It was absolutely of no effort. It, it's not our effort it, that makes you and I a child of God. Jesus' description corrects human hopes that we might somehow inherit goodness from parents. You ain't going to inherit God God given anything from your parents. It's, it, it doesn't work that way. You can't earn it by good behavior. You can't earn it because grandma and grandpa used to be in church all the time. Grandpa maybe was a preacher or a circuit riding preacher or whatever. Doesn't have us anything to do with it. We, we correct associations, hanging out, going to church. I, I say it all the time, but it's, it's, it's still true. Just because you're coming to church don't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you an automobile. It just doesn't work that way. Jesus' statement to Nicodemus that evening had been heralded to all the world ever since. Both Jew and Gentiles have heard the divine mandate that you must be born again. You must. It's not a, it, 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 it is an option, but it's not an option if you want to go to heaven. Amen? People will say, well, if God's such a good God, if He's such a great God, how, if He's so loving and He's so compassionate and all this, how can a, a God like that send people to hell? Well, uh, He doesn't. I don't believe for one minute that God sends anybody to hell right now. If you end up in hell, it's because you chose that. Because he said in his word, I've made a way. It's through Jesus Christ. He's not willing, the Bible said, that any would perish, but all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's as simple as believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. That's God's word. If you reject that and refuse that, amen, that's bad. That's bad. So behind the challenge is his invitation to each of us to be born again. And, and Jesus uses the illustration of the wind to depict the, the effects of the Spirit in the person born of the Spirit. Uh, you, you can't see the wind, right? Can't see it, but you can feel it. You can't see the Holy Spirit of God, but you can feel him. You can see the effects of him. You can see the change in your life or in someone else's life because of the Holy Spirit. People can control neither the wind nor the movement of the Spirit of God. So just as we don't know the origin or the destination of the wind, we don't know or control the Spirit. You cannot control the Spirit. You know why? What would happen, church? Let me ask this question. What would happen if you could control the Spirit of God? What would happen? Huh? Give me an example. Whatever you asked, you got. How many of you can look back far enough over your life and say, God, thank you that you did not answer that prayer the way I was hoping you would? Amen? We're like, woo! Glory! Because if he had, we would be in a heap of trouble. And if we could just go to the Lord and, 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 and just, you know, I want this or I want that or I want the other thing, he would just become like a yes man. Grant you, you know, like a genie in a bottle, just grant you every wish. I'm reminded of the story of a guy that, that 
received a, a, a wish, and you know what he wished? He wished that everything that he touched would turn to gold. And they granted the wish. The problem with that was that everything that he touched turned to gold. Including his food, including his kids, including everything that he touched, it turned to gold. So what he wanted for increase brought death and destruction, really. So I'm grateful that God does not grant us everything we ask for. He's good enough to say no. How many of you, have mom, as mom and dad, have said no to your child? Well, you're just so mean. I'm the only one, right? I'm a bus driver. I say it all the time. Yeah, well, but, but you're pretty smart for a bus driver. I've heard that. <laughs> From a little, little girl, you're pretty smart for a bus driver. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. But as parents, as being, being wiser than our child, we, are, we at least ought to be smart enough to know to say no to your child. They might be angry at you for a few minutes, but the reality is, you know what? Too bad. I'm dad. <laughs> I'm Elsha dad. <laughs> Not really, but you know what I'm saying. So I want for us to pick it up on uh, at Titus chapter 3, uh, verses 4 through 7, talking about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. How many of us just want to get renewed by the Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. I mean, I could take, I could, I could handle a little renewing even right here tonight. This is what it says. But when the kindness and the love of, of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Some words there jump out at me. I don't know if words... I don't know if words jump out at you, but words jump out at me. Uh, For example, um, uh, verse 6, whom he poured out, the Holy Spirit. He poured out the Holy Spirit. On us. Amen? I mean, when's the last time you thought about and or, or you just poured out something? When you pour something out, it splashes and goes everywhere. I like the concept of the Holy Spirit being poured out, not just a little dab. We're not talking about dippity-doo or brill cream. We're, talking, we're not talking a little dab will do you. Amen? I mean, we're talking a gully washer. Fortunately for us, God has intervened, and His kindness and His love appeared in the human form of Jesus Christ. And so by His death, He saved us from our deserved punishment for disobeying God. Listen, you can't help but disobey God until you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. I want you to I want that to sink in for you for to you for just a minute because you your it's your nature. People people are raising barnyard animals now in their homes, right? Pigs. They got these little mini cows, which by the way. I think they're pretty darn cute. Them little baby miniature cows, they are pretty cute. Little horses, little miniature horses. But can I tell you something? You can take a pig and you can scrub. You see it at the fair every year. Well, they got COVID now. We don't get to walk. We don't get to go to the fair anymore. But, 
Back in the day, you used to go to the fair and they would take them pigs and they would have their hooves be painted. Them girls would paint their hooves all up and put bows on them and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Scrub them all up, make them nice. You turn that dude loose and guess what? He's going right to the mud. Why? What's that? It's what? It's their nature. It is their nature. And, and our nature before Christ is a sin nature, a nature of rebellion. We can't help but be against God until we have had the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You can't do anything but reject Him. So by his death, he saved us from our deserved punishment. And he offers this salvation because of his mercy alone, not because we deserved it by doing good things. So Paul then summarizes what God does for us when he saves us. God washes away our sins. How? What's that? By the blood. We are washed by the blood of the Lamb. So Paul explains the transaction. When believers receive this washing of rebirth, all sins, say all sins. All sins. Say all sins. all sins. Say all sins like you mean it. All, all sins. sins. <laughs> Some, Glenn, <laughs> I, <laughs> I might have to have you be like the sergeant of arms because we've got an unruly one back there. <laughs> oh, well, he did what I said. Exactly. Paul explains this transaction when believers receive this washing of rebirth that all sins, not just some sins, are washed away. What do you think it means when he says all sins? So define all. From here back? That's what I was trying to get at. That's exactly what I'm trying. Not just today and yesterday. He's seen... Now, does that give us... Liberty to just go out and just live ever how we want to? No, it does not. But I can tell you this, as we, as children of God, are trying to live for the Lord, and we, anybody besides the preacher, screw it up every once in a while. Like, you know, maybe once an hour. I, what is going on here? She's going to get you? <laughs> he said in his word that he has known us from before the foundations of the earth. And he's had a purpose and a plan for us since before the foundation of the earth. And he has a call on our life from before the foundation. He knows my beginning and he knows my end. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, all those, if he's all those omnis, do you not think that he has seen our end? And, and when you blow it tomorrow... He's seen that. But yet he's called me to preach the gospel. He's called me to pastor this congregation in this church, knowing that I blow it every now and then. So my, my intention is not to blow it. That's not my intention. 
My intention is to live righteously before God. The Bible says, be perfect even as I am perfect, right? But we have to remember what perfect means. It's not perfection like we, re- like, like we visualize perfection. It's not talking about being perfect. That word perfection there that he's using to be perfect is to be mature, to grow up. Hello. How many of you know some of us, some of us as adult Christians need to grow up? Need to grow up. The Bible... Am I going to have to separate you two? It's him. (laughs) Now we're pointing fingers. It's him. He's the one. <laughs> oh, my. Listen, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's an amazing thing. Yeah, the, it, it's a scriptural concept that the Bible makes very plain that we need to come away from spiritual milk Hello, and move on into you know some some meatier kind of snacks. That's a process called growing up. That's a process called maturing. And and we're called to do that. So Paul says when we gain new life because of the rebirth and all those kinds of things, but but we gain new life with all of its treasures. Listen, even though I blow it, and I had this conversation with Bob this last week because I blow it, and I, I get so frustrated when I blow it, when I mess up, and, and I feel like sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I just feel like what in the world is even the point? I, I just seem to blow it. And you know what Bob said? I think I said this on Sunday. But Bob said, you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather have you blowing it than you never being messed with by the devil. Because the reality is, if you're not a threat to him, he's probably not going to do much messing around with you. But the more we try, and I've told so many people when they've given their life to the Lord, don't think for one minute now just because you have given your life to the Lord that life is going to be a box of chocolates. That you're not going to have any more trouble. I'm a child of God. All my troubles are gone. Not so. Now you have like a bullseye on you. And so we have to understand that. We gain new life with all of its treasures. My my sins have all been forgiven. The process is complete. You're not going to be any more saved tomorrow than you are today. I want you to understand this tonight. You, if you have accept, if you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth, Jesus Christ, you are saved. You are not. It's like a woman getting pregnant. She is pregnant. You're not a little bit pregnant. You are pregnant. You're not going to be more pregnant eight months down the road than you are the day of conception. You're pregnant. And church, you are saved on the day you get saved. And you're I'm no more saved than you are just because I'm the pastor. Amen? I'm just, I'm trying to help us here tonight, all of us. The process is complete. We can experience what we have in new ways, but we have received the whole package. We live a new life because of the Holy Spirit who He generously poured out on us because of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, did. So if you recall... When we we have talked about the Trinity, all three persons of the Trinity are mentioned in these verses because all three participate in the work of salvation. 
So based on the redemptive work of the Son, the Father forgives and sends the Holy Spirit to wash away our sins and to continually renew us. What am I even talking about? What, what, what are you talking about, preacher, that he's continually renewing us? Well, what do you think I'm talking about? I, I mean, I can tell you I already got the answer. I got, but what do you think I'm talking about? Okay? That's us. That's not him. That's us. Right? What's he doing? What did I just say? Because he is continually, the Holy Spirit, to wash away our sins and continually renew us. So it's a work of the Holy Spirit. So somebody tell me what it is. How about this? What? Say it. No. How? No. no. Huh? When? What? His mercies are... His mercies are new every morning. See, I can stand up here and tell you this, but it's better for you if I can pull it out of you. His mercies are new every morning. I don't know about the rest of you, but that makes me pretty happy. His, I get a brand new dose of mercy every day. Woo! His mercies are new every day. He, he, he is continually renewing us. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Hello? Point at yourself with your finger and tell yourself, I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. That means everything you do, you're taking Him with you. Hey, I'm the temple. The temple. The tabernacle, the tent of dwelling, the Holy Spirit. When, when I got saved, he moved in. He, he's, he's seated right here on the throne of my heart. So while it's true that every individual is, a, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul's teaching here about the nature of the church or Christian community. And Corinth boasted many uh, uh, pagan temples and shrines, but there was only one temple for God. The Corinthian Christians were it. When we were in Utah... The very first temple that Joseph Smith ever built was in St. George, Utah. And a, just a select uh, number of cities have a temple in them. I think the closest temple that we have here is up in Salem. Or up in that country up there, just south of Portland. Uh, not a temple, I don't think. There might be a tabernacle, but I don't think it's a temple. They're, 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 I mean, they're, it, y everywhere you go, <laughs> the temple of God is there. You can walk into any place and the temple of God is there because you are the temple. The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit who Jesus promised would come and live in his followers. He talked about it in John 14, and he talked about it in John 16. The Holy Spirit draws you and I, all believers, together as the body, uh, as Christ's body on earth, and he provides the unity that should characterize them. What, why, why did they have such an outpouring 
of the Holy Spirit in the upper room. Do what? They were of one mind and one accord. They were in agreement. They had one focus. They knew who they were, and they were all seeking God. They were in one mind, and they were in one accord. And I'm telling you, unity ought to characterize the church. Can I just tell you, I'm so proud of this body. I, as a, your pastor, I just want to tell you, I'm so proud of you because we do not have a bunch of yapping and nipping and biting and belly aching and, and well, I'll tell you what, brother, dry as a bone said to about sister smell fungus or what, you know. We don't have that. We do not have that. And I'm grateful. And that is, frankly, why this church is going to continue to grow. Because we love. How many times have we had people come here and they've said, I felt loved the very first time I ever came in this place. And that's what Jesus said in his word, you will be known by your love one for another. And, and you, church, it ain't me, it's you. You are the ones that are loving. You are the ones that are, that are doing it, and you're to be commended for that. And I'm, as your pastor, I'm commending you right now. Pat yourself on the back. You, di you did good. You're doing good. Be so because every believer is the temple of the Holy Spirit, a dwelling place for him, you and I as believers ought, to be, uh, ought not be dividing into warring factions because that destroys the temple. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. What does that mean? That means you've been bought with a price. He purchased us. That's what to, well, yeah, I'll date myself. How many of you remember on 2nd Street in Myrtle Creek, Oregon, uh, where, when they used to have an S&H green stamp store? My favorite thing to do was, was when you went to the Super Y, they would, you bought X amount of groceries and... Vivian would stick her finger in the deal and she would go <laughs> and see it would spit out all these green stamps and my mom had these books and my favorite thing to do was lick them green stamps and put them in that book. And when you got it, come on Gene, that's good preaching right there. Glory to God. <laughs> and, and when you got enough of those books no, you didn't cash them in. You redeemed them. You redeemed them. And when you redeemed them, you received something back. And Jesus Christ has redeemed us. And we need to pull, give back to Him all of our lives, all of our love, all of our service. We've been redeemed, church. Amen. He licked us and put us in His book. Whoa, you never thought of salvation like that before, did you? That only comes from a truck driver. We understood. That is Myrtle Creekian to the core. But you get it, don't you? Because church, we've been redeemed. 
You are no longer your own. The words your body in this verse refer not to the corporate body of Christ, but literally to each believer's individual physical body. Every believer should view his or her body as a temple of the Holy Spirit who, ha- who is living in them. When, when I bump into Mike, I've just bumped into the temple of the Holy Spirit. When I bump into George, I've just bumped into the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's just how it is. Jesus died to pay the high price that purchased sinful people's freedom. You can read about it in Ephesians 1 and 7. You can read about it in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. His blood and His blood alone. Let me stress that to you tonight. It was His blood that He provided that was the sacrifice that made you and I acceptable to God. Nothing else. Nothing you can add, nothing you take away, nothing. His blood made you and I acceptable to God. And because of the death of Jesus and because of his resurrection, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in those who believe in him and he took up residence in our bodies. He is in here. He is in here. He is in there. He is in each, every one of us. And so the Holy Spirit had come into them when they believed. These folks that gave their life to Jesus, I can't even tell you what their names are, but on Sunday morning when two people, two new temples of the Holy Spirit of God were created, redeemed that in that moment, They didn't offer nothing. The the only thing that they offered was a walk from over there to here. And by doing that, they denied their flesh because I guarantee you, as you well know, that when you got saved, your flesh was probably yelling like mine was, "Just, just sit down. Just don't, do not go up there. <laughs> Anybody besides the preacher? <laughs> It's like, man, what are they going to think? Hey, they don't even know you. What could they think? And that's what I love about this church. We rejoice when somebody gets saved. The Bible says angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner gets saved. We ought to just explode when somebody gives it. I didn't even see him. Mike's like, because Mike, you don't know about this about Mike, but Mike is disobedient. Because I say, everybody, bow your head and close your eyes and pray. And Mike's like. (laughs) He's looking around. You know why? Because it excites him. Because he knows that it's part of me. And Mike's like, over there. And I look and sure enough, (laughs) glory to God. That's awesome. I forgive you. That is a miracle. That's the greatest miracle that there ever was. Amen. There's nothing better. Nothing better. So the Holy Spirit comes into us when we believe. Believers, oh, you ain't going to even like this. Probably should just shut the camera off and mute me. Because y- y'all ain't going to like this at all. Believers, therefore, remember what I said, whenever you see the word therefore, it's therefore a reason. Believers, therefore, do not belong to themselves. You do not belong to yourself. God bought you. You've been purchased, redeemed. So we must honor God with our bodies. How in the world, and I'm closing, I'm stopping in just a minute. I think. (laughs) Evangelistically speaking. How, 
How? Have, listen, let me say this again. Believers, therefore, do not belong to themselves. God bought them, so they must honor God with their bodies. How in the world can we honor God with our body tomorrow? I don't want generalizations, okay? I want specific. Okay, all right, good, good. What does that look like? No, I want, I'm going to nail you down. I'm going to nail you down. I want to know exactly what you're going to do. I don't want to, I don't want, gen, I, God, I thank you for the breath that I'm breathing. What are you going to do with the breath that I've given you besides just go and serve him at work? What is that going to look like? Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. That's, that's what I'm talking about right there. That's exactly what I'm talking about. See, we want to hear about it and we want to talk about it, but when it comes right down to the fact that I don't belong to myself anymore, God has bought me, so I must honor God with my body, what does that mean? What does that look like? Go to Matthew chapter 28 and read the last four or five verses. Go ye. Who's ye? Ye be ye. Ye be ye. He's talking to you. And what is he telling you to do? To what? To go where? Where does it say to start? It's, it's, it, it says to start in Myrtle Creek. That's exactly what it says. And then from Myrtle Creek, you go to Douglas County and to Oregon and to the nation and to the world. That's the pattern that is being put forth there. He says, go ye. How many of ye be going? Well, then why isn't the church filled up? <laughs> but this is Wednesday. And I'm going to keep encouraging you. And I'm going to keep encouraging every one of you because until every one of us are doing our part, the church is never going to be the church. We've got, to in, we've got to go beyond just inviting. Remember the word provoke? We've got to provoke people. You know what? The statistic says that something like 90% of people would come to church if somebody just invited them. But we don't invite them because we're afraid they'll reject us. We're afraid they'll turn us down. We're afraid they'll call us Bible thumper. Hey, I got a whole logging crew up there call me Pew Jumper. <laughs> and I said, you're exactly right, except with their chairs. You know why? Because they know something about me. And I, every time I get an invitation, an opportunity to make an invitation, I take it. One of these days, somebody's going to take me up on it. Amen? Believers don't belong to themselves. God bought them so they... It says they must. As a parent, when you tell your child, you must have your room clean by the time I get home, what are you saying? Pardon me? By the look on your face, there's implication there. If that dude isn't clean, there's going to be trouble. And God, our Father, our loving Father, is saying we must honor Him with our bodies. We must be doing something. 
Preacher, how do I even tell somebody about God? You have a story. You have a story. Which is, yes, it's your testimony, but it's a story. And you know your story better than anybody in the world knows your story. And you can share your story better than anybody in the whole world. And if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll study your story, if you'll get comfortable with your story so that it's just always right there, well, let me tell you. And I mean, it just begins to just flow out of you. And I, I was a drunk. I smoked all kinds of dope. I took cross tops. I just, I was a, I was a, absolutely a mess but one day I met Jesus and my whole life has been changed I surrendered my life to Jesus when I was in school those two right over there could tell you I wouldn't I wouldn't go to the front of the classroom and give a speech or do a math problem on the chalkboard for love nor money or all the tea in China this fat boy I wasn't fat then I weighed up I was a whopping 106 pounder, but I was, I was big. I was huge. It's a giant of a man. I'm twice the man I used to be, frankly. Anyway, um, <laughs> I wasn't going up there. There's no way I was going up there. And here I am in God's humor. I'm in the front of the class twice a week. Because God said, honor him. And so God can do that for you. I mean, you just tell them your story. Tell them what God has done for you. Tell them, tell them the things that God has redeemed you from. Yeah. I haven't had a chew of Copenhagen since 1991. That's a long time. It was pretty cheap back in them days. Not going to do it. I didn't do that myself. God helped me do that. God gave me the strength. God can do anything for us, church. Amen? I truly believe that. Um, <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm done. Right? That's good. That's good. Well, when, when I asked about things you must do, the look that she had on her face if her children didn't get the room clean, I saw it. I saw that. And we love her for it. Church, listen. Listen. This is not a social club. This, this, is, this, is, this is a family. This is, this is a body. This is His body. And, and He redeemed us. He bought us. He purchased us. And I, for one, surely did not deserve it. But He loved me so much that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but would have everlasting life. That's us, church. Listen, we have the answer to this world's problems. And His name's Jesus. And He's just asking us, whether you're dressed like a logger or whether you're in a three-piece business suit, God wants to use you to get his message out. You can reach people that I can't reach. I reach people you'll never reach. God loves you. God has a purpose for you. You're not just, you're not just here sucking wind tonight for no good reason. No update on Lacey, by the way. Just got that message. We need to continue to pray for her. We need to continue to pray for 
little Joe, is it Joe's, Jody? Little Jody, seven years old. And uh, man, my heart breaks for that little girl and her family. Let's, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Father God, tonight, we just, uh, we love you. And we lift these precious girls, whether women or, or children, they're girls, they're your girls, they're your daughters, Lord. And God, from little Jody to Lacey to others of us tonight that are fighting one thing or the other, whether it's a, 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 a head cold or some uh, form of cancer or, or whatever the case may be, arthritis or any of those kinds of things, God, we just lift them to you tonight and ask you, by, by your stripes, Lord, you said they were healed. Lord, we call, we call forth your word tonight, Lord. We call forth your word. And Lord, we apply it to those lives. Heal Lacey in your mighty name, with your mighty power. Heal Jody with your mighty name, in your mighty power. Lord, every one of us tonight that need a touch in our body, whether it's in our mind, physical, mental, spiritual, or emotional, God, touch us, heal us. Restore us. We're grateful tonight that your word declares that our, your mercy is new every morning. We are grateful for that. Lord, I ask you to watch over each one of us throughout the remainder of this week. Bring us back together on Sunday. Lord, I pray for the ladies as they get together tomorrow. I pray for whoever's speaking tomorrow that you would anoint them, Lord, to declare not just some cute little Bible study, but that you would give them the anointing and the authority, God, to declare your word to women who need to know your word who need to understand who they are in Christ Jesus. Lord, and I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for, for all that you're doing in this church, that you're just drawing people in. Lord, from the north and the south and the east and the west, Lord, you're bringing them in. And Lord, I pray that you bring with them, Lord, the resources and the finances to build this building. God, I pray for favor with the county and with the city, Lord, and with everybody involved, Lord, in this project. And Lord, I just, in advance, give you the thanks and the praise and the glory for all that you're doing in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Amen. And amen. Hey, thanks for watching tonight by way of the internet. We just uh, pray that, that some way tonight you've gained something uh, uh, from God's word that has impacted and changed your life. Amen. So join us again on Sunday. Until then, God bless you and good night.